Hello and welcome back. My name is Derek Main. This has been, I think, the longest period of time between videos that I've ever had. And I've been thinking about making like some changes, I'd say, you know, to to this structure and format. I mean, I still want to do it. This this was really the first thing that I started doing where I felt like I put myself out there in terms of celebrating like my love of literature and I love it. It's just really difficult for me personally to balance like a desire to take the literature seriously and to give it, you know, the sort of like attention and, and, love for lack of a better word off the top of my head that it deserves without um, it taking over my life because I am not a critic. I am not an academic. I am um, a fan. And I know I've said this a, a bunch, but like that, that creates um, some balance issues for me in discussing some work. Um, but anyway, I'm back. I'm, I think that at least for today, I'm just going to talk about uh, some books I've been reading, a couple books I'm looking forward to reading, and we'll see where this goes. Um, I'm involved in a project um, that will launch in a few weeks where I think I may like connect this channel to that and... Um, and then be on an actually regular schedule. Um, and that would also involve me hopefully having some conversations with other book lovers um, on here, you know, through this medium. And um, so anyway, I I am looking forward to the future and I'm just, you know, I'm not trying to be, you know, vague or whatever, but that's what's been going on with me. I hope everyone is well, as well as they can be. You know, we, I, um, I empathize, sympathize with basically everyone who has had to exist in this world um, in any way. The past, you know, fill in the how far back you want to go. Uh, but it is, it's, it's certainly been um, a trying time. Well, speaking of trying times, the first thing I want to talk about is this biography I just finished. Uh, and I'm saying trying times because, whoo. Uh, a couple world wars and uh, political stuff we got to discuss, unfortunately. But uh, Luis Ferdinand Celine, Journeys to the Extremes. And this is by Dami Damien Catani. And it was put out this year. This is a new book. Let me get the press right. I don't think it's one that I... Reaction books. So this documentary, this documentary, this biography, I really, really uh, enjoyed and, and can recommend it. It does help tremendously to have an interest in Celine. Like, if you don't have an interest in Celine, then like, okay, this is the question of how does this biography stand up against just like, oh, I want to pick up a biography to learn about somebody's life. You need to have an interest, I think, in his literary style and in the conundrum, which is feels like a really shallow way of describing it, but the uh, the conflict inherent in um, in Celine because uh, Celine is more than just problematic. Um, while I don't know well legally his a his actions uh, during World War II did not, I don't think rise to the official um, moniker of collaborator. Uh, but he, he was a fascist. He was a fascist sympathizer. Um, and he certainly was anti-Semitic. And, and this is all during a time where that um, caused the death, torture, destruction of an, um, of a whole a race of people and an amount of people that is un, unfathomable. And sometimes I feel like as we get further away from that defining event, of the 20th century, our coldness towards it grows. And, and you see a lot of the same initial sort of 
um, strains on the system that um, rose, that allowed a rise of nationalism and fervor anti-Semitism. I'm sorry that I can't talk um, now. And I am not doing that thing where I am comparing, you know, a nascent or waning alt-right movement today with Nazis, because that is not intellectually honest in my personal opinion. But we are interested, at least I am, in how these horrific ideologies come into being and the life cycle of these horrific ideologies. So anyway, Selim, um, I'm not going to do a book report on this one. The, the thing that we're really interested in reading this book is how can he, how does he exist in, in both realms as the sort of loving, caring doctor and champion of the lower classes, obviously incredibly literary stylist, um, and also his abhorrent political views, pamphleteering, fascism, um, all of that. And so that stuff is really, really interesting throughout, particularly interesting his experiences in World War I and how they shape him. That's the initial human horror that he sees and then um, becomes a, a, a pacifist and, and really sort of starts the seed, I think, of, of leading him down the, the path where he can take these little baby steps towards where he ends up. Um, also, though, there is another thesis of the book that um, uh, would be more in line with um, may, maybe saying that there wasn't necessarily baby steps, that this was always here, it was always latent, um, and I'm not here to, I, I don't know, the man is, is very much dead, so we can't ask him or uh, psychoanalyze him right now. So a couple of things that I want to, during the petite bourgeois childhood section, which is really interesting, um, I liked this, in literature, this is one of my favorite devices, both as a writer and a reader. Um, and it's about the chronology of events and memory. And I am really, really obsessed with this. And I've used it actually a ton in, in my own work. It is an intuitive thing. I, it's nothing sort of invented or stolen, you know. But, but but it is an intuitive thing, I think, that a lot of people who have maybe struggles with memory, a lot of people who are um, very hyperbolic by nature, so they tend to, um, and I, when I'm saying they, I'm including myself because I'm like this, tend to put filters on events that happened in their life, um, and they become different. They become warped um, in a way. Uh, than how they actually happen. So I really like this section. His novel draws primarily, and that's in italics, on his childhood experiences, but these experiences are transposed through the prism of his imagination into a new type of literary language. The change in chronology reflects what Godard refers to as Céline's discontinuous style, his shift towards narrative technique that recounts key events from his life, not in the order in which they happened, but the disorder in which he remembers them. And I'm very, very interested in that. And of course, Celine's life, um, you know, being in, imprisoned and exiled for his fascist sympathies, um, being a literary enfant terrible and and being at the height of literary stardom um, prior to World War II, um, after Journey to the End of the Night comes out. Um, his many marriages, his overseas travel, his time in Africa, his time in World War I in the trenches where he's badly injured and suffers from extreme PTSD. Uh, all of those things, he had a rich uh, life and a very, very interesting life. And it certainly makes for a really good study of um, a certain era, a certain type of person in that era. But it also, um, luckily for us, he, he was such a, a great writer that he wrote these experiences from his first person. And it helps us understand um, that time period better. I think Celine is, um, I've come to think, I should say, that Celine is, it, it, is an important literary figure, of course, that's as I was saying, but an important literary figure uh, to understanding, I think, at least for me, 100 years later, um, 
you know, that time period and, and how, um, how it affected um, certain elements of, of society, maybe in surprising ways. So, um, yeah, it's really good going into the World War One stuff and how that just screws him up forever. Um, his book, this is talking about during the night after, you know, the first section that's all on the war. His book was therefore primarily cathartic, a necessary release from the intolerable psychological nightmare. He, as well as an entire generation of young men, had been unable to shake off for almost two decades. And that's what I mean there by um, a, a time period and, and, and whatever. This last place I want to mention this is from a, a crucial chapter, anti-Semite and fascist sympathizer, and that's when you get into the bulk of this um, abhorrent uh, conflict that exists and lives within Selene, and that has to then exist and live within his readers and his scholars. On the other hand, if Hewitt correctly pinpoints Selene's racism, he also maintains that this racism was deliberately camouflaged in trifles for a massacre via a strategy that philosopher and critic Walter Benjamin called the cult of the joke. This practice, typical of many fascist propagandists at the time, consists of saying the unacceptable in such a way that it can be taken as a joke while still insidiously making its point. And I, I, I found that section very, very uh, interesting. I had not heard that cult of the joke terminology before, and I think it's very helpful and instructive. So one thing that's going on in my reading life and that should be going on in everybody's reading life, it's kind of exciting, weird transition, but whatever, is um, Donkey Archive being like kind of back up and running. I've got three right here that I am really, well, one I finished and two I'm really excited to get into. Uh, but the most exciting thing I think is Miss McIntosh, My Darling, which is coming out. Uh, a new issue of, which for those of us who have tried for many, many, I mean, you know, many, many years, I, I don't know, I hoped to, to stumble upon it. I probably could try it harder, but I just didn't have the money to afford one of these copies. Um, so I'm really excited about it. I'm hoping to do a group read with some folks. Uh, it is, you know, it's just one of those books like I always, always wanted to read. And so this year I have two, two books that are kind of the top of my list for these are my reading goals in 22. The first one is going to be that one. And the second one is I want to read Ulysses with someone else. I'm hopeful that I think I'm going to read it with my friend Sam, who has, um, he's a phenomenal writer and, and he has uh, read it before. I think he starts it every Bloomsday. Uh, I want to read it with someone else and to be able, so I have only ever been able to get through like the first, 200 pages or so um and then when i've tried to do it with some study aids and stuff which i've only tried once um i just was like all right this is like a lot i'd like to do this with someone else reading is a lonely endeavor um and i really really enjoy what i've what i have read and i mean thought is the thought of thought is a, an obtrusive thought of my own um of course written by Joyce, but that that you know always comes up there. I am very interested in, in it. I just want to read it with somebody. So that and and that the other one. So on the theory of prose here, Victor Shklovsky, translated by Shushin Avagayan. Um, I don't read any uh, you know literary theory. I don't really. I'm not much about theory, but I just I I was like kind of interested in this one. You know, it's like. Victor Shklovsky, 1893 to 1984, was a leading figure in the Russian formulist movement of the 1920s. I mean, I just wanted to really get a sense of like, okay, well, what is like the theory of prose? What does this mean in the 1920s when, for me personally, why I'm interested, because our entertainment options in the 1920s are so vastly um, less, <laughs> I mean, there's just not the same world at all that we're living in now, that the opportunity to study literature and think of literature as, as something that could be all of these different things and then kind of collate what it does, how it does it and stuff, uh, is just interesting. And, and in fact, I think it, uh, you know, as this book, it seems to still be very relevant, a lot of his ideas. I found the first chapter, Art as a Device, incredible. I mean, I like really, really dug into that bit. Um, the connection between devices of plot construction and general devices of style was pretty good. Um, and then the Don Quixote stuff was interesting. 
Otherwise, I was brushing through a lot of this because it was way over my head. Just, or like just not interested in the examples, like not, I mean, it just becomes pretty heavily academic. But I mean, the first chapter honestly alone was worth it. It's something that I will probably dip into more and more. I don't know if I'm gonna read it. I, I really like a lot of the stuff about images um, in this first chapter. Uh, it, uh, Putnam Bia, uh, <laughs> and his, that's a person, and his numerous followers consider poetry to be a special kind of thought, thought with the help of imagery. And the task of imagery, according to them, is to help organize different objects and actions into groups in order to explain the unknowns by means of the known. And he's going to then go into if this works, if it doesn't. But I, even just that little nugget alone there um, is enough. It gets my sort of wheel spinning. And maybe that's the purpose of theory, right? It's like I don't need to like know or, or be, you know, whatever, like well-read or smart enough in these subjects to really get it. I can just like hear a line like that and think about that. Okay, is that it? Is that what the task of imagery is? Organizing different objects and actions into groups in order to explain the unknown by means of the known. And he's actually gonna um, beat that up a little bit and deconstruct it. Anyway, that was good. Two, I haven't started yet, but I'm excited. Right here we got Warner Koffler at the writing desk, translated by Lauren K. Wolf. Um, and I'll give you just the brief. Sitting behind his desk, armed with notebook, ashtray, whiskey, and several typewriters of various calibers, Werner Koffler embarks on a belligerent tour through Austrian and European cultural life. Art must destroy reality, he declares, and this book documents his attempts to create a fiction that would supplant the unsavory banalities of life. With great style and imagination, Koffler follows in the formidable footsteps of countrymen Carl Cross and Thomas Bernard, presenting an acerbic, satirical send-up of his era's cultural and literary status quo. Has there ever been a blurb that is more right up my alley? I'm really excited about that. And then this one, kind of a random pull here. I think this came from Dustin Illingworth, the excellent critic, has done a couple times, like, Hey, what are your under-read, under-known docky books? A lot of times when the docky conversation comes up, um, you're going to have people like me who just are going to go on and on about Wittgenstein's Mistress by David Markson and and whatever. Um, the Tunnel I read this year, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I'm not getting into that at all. There's so much better scholarship on that. But that's another one that kind of will occasionally uh, come up. This is one I feel like that comes up in that under whatever, uh, maybe underappreciated. I think that's where I got it. This is from their American Literature series. Locos, A Comedy of Gestures by Felipe Alfua. Um, and this, oh, it just has an afterword. Okay, afterword by Mary McCarthy. Okay, I thought there was a, I thought there was an introduction. Um, I don't really know a lot about this. I'm gonna tell you exactly why I got it, and that is, the second part of the blurb, first published in 1936 and long neglected, this elegantly inventive novel anticipates works like Pale Fire and 100 Years of Solitude. So, I, I mean, I'm not even a Nabokov fan, but I'm addicted to Pale Fire, particularly the construction and sort of like what it can do and what it can house. So I'm really, really interested in reading that, honestly, a lot of time, I mean, you know, someone recommended it, but also just the blurb stuff. The the fact that that there might be an anticipation of something like uh, Pale Fire. So I'm really interested in that. The last thing I'm reading is an arc I'll be reviewing. This is Livermush by Graham Urban, um, a poetry collection, although collection, it, it, is a, it is a full beginning to end story. So um, I'm not exactly sure how yet I want to categorize it. And since I'm reviewing it, I'm not going to give like too, too much away. This is from Back Patio Press, by the way. But um, it's tremendous. And that's all I think I'm going to say now because I am going to review it for that new project I'm working on. Um, but Back Patio Press, Little Mush, Graham Urban. Um, very surprising and definitely like if you want, if you are interested in that, like shoot me um, uh, a DM or something on on Twitter, I'm at mainly, M-A-I-N-E-L-Y, I think it is. Um, and I'll send you a link to like, uh, he, there's a couple of excerpts of that on different places. And once you see an excerpt, I think you'll you'll either like 
like me, you'll kind of be like all in, or you're like, ah, oh, I'm not sure if this is my thing, whatever. Um, and, and that is because like, it is stylistically like very different. And uh, I don't know, I think it's just one of those things where you either like the taste or you don't, um, you know, uh, but I, I love it, I think it's fantastic. And Graham is um, a, a formidable, incredible writer. I'm excited to review that. So anyway, that's what I've been reading. I got a couple other, I guess I didn't pull out the rim rod. I've been dipping my toes in this. Rimba, the complete work, Selective Letters. It's a bilingual edition, which I really, really like. Um, and it's translated with an introduction and notes by Wallace Fowley. And this is like the standard. Like when you think of Rimba and the books, this is probably the one that everybody's seen. I'm not even sure if it's Chicago, University of Chicago Press. I'm not sure if it's like the best one to have or anything. I Honestly, I got it because I've been learning French since the beginning of the pandemic. I did the Duolingo thing because for my 40th birthday, the whole plan was we were going to go with the whole family, all four of us were going to go to Paris. I've never been um, to Europe. I've only been outside the country twice, once to a suburb of Toronto to visit um, my great grandmother when I was a child, Guelph, and then um, once to the Dominican Republic um, before I had kids of uh, my wife's family all went down there and that was like, you know, you're in a hotel and you're at like, I don't know, it's not, doesn't feel very, feels like it could be anywhere. Um, so anyway, I, I've traveled the country in America extensively, um, luckily, and, but I have not had the opportunity to go overseas very much. And so I decided for our 40th birthday that I wanted to pick somewhere to go, learn as much of the language as I could away from here and go. And I chose Paris because like, obviously, um, you know, uh, I don't think it is between Berlin and Paris, just to be totally upfront. Those are two very different languages, cultures, and countries, obviously. I went with Paris because I thought, frankly, the language would be a little easier to get a grasp of. Um, and just literary wise, I mean, so much of my own um, love of translated fiction and then literature in general and philosophy, um, so much of that comes from from the French. And, and so, um, I do, I don't drink, which is a little bit of a funny thing that like one of the most reasons people really like to go is, you know, to enjoy the amazing wine. And I don't have that anymore. So that's a little weird. Um, in a couple of weeks, I think it'll be my ninth or 10th year of, of not drinking. Uh, but I, that's okay. I'll enjoy, I'll enjoy Paris regardless. Although it is something that it's kind of odd, but this, it really is really awesome to take about 30 minutes and so like, you know, I do the Duolingo every day, but then take 30 minutes and like poetry is such a wonderful way to learn a language. And honestly, I think that it's helping my own writing some in how, how simple, the simple beauty of not just the language, but the way in which you see it be translated, you know, especially sentences like, Quelqu'un de voix, toujours angélique, il s'agit de moi, vertements explique. And I can't pronounce anything, so excuse me for that. And this is from Age to Or, Golden Age. That translates here to one of the voices, always angelic. It is about me, openly expresses itself. The construction of, of, of how the words are phrased like there is, is really interesting to me and helps me to think about our language, the language that I speak, how it's used, and then maybe how it can even be messed with a little bit. So I, I'm enjoying dipping out of this. I have a marker in here from... Um, Oh, I think it's stuff about his father. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna read that. The letters are really good, really interesting. I'm obviously and always, I think I've read from, you know, I read from Fontes, you know, I, I'm i always interested in um, the letters of writers. In fact, it's one thing that I really, I'll end on this. I hope that we're able to sort of find a way, because blogs aren't quite it, to have that sort of long form private communication um, that's really a well-crafted and sort of beautiful piece of writing on its own letters. And the fact that that's gone away culturally in many ways, it feels like a shame because there's so many writers now who um, I would I would love to at some point 
read their letters, you know, and, and by I, I mean, I'm going to be dead, but, uh, that next generation of readers and stuff. And I hope there is something happening now amongst writers where there is some way to, um, categorize and understand this time, uh, not through the lens only of communication through social media or private messages, but that more longer, you know, a letter. And, and, and so maybe that's just gone and done, in which case, um, you know, there's plenty to enjoy in the past, but it's such an excellent, excellent peek into the window of a mind, a creative mind while they're working. All right. Be good to yourself. This went 25 minutes, way longer. Um, like I said, I'll try to be back more. I'll be back with kind of an exciting, like, here's the new thing with the place that I'm doing and channel and, and that'll be cool. But thanks guys.